Expert climber Matt Briggs is exploring the New Zealand Alps when disaster strikes. A deadly fall leaves him crippled and alone in a hostile wilderness. I almost want to vomit from the force of that pain. With only his dog for company, his very survival depends on battling nature, his body. You know it's going to hurt. And sheer terror. I'm losing a lot of blood. I'm going to have to do this the hard way. But the mountain won't let him go. The 33-year-old Englishman Matt Briggs has started a new life on the other side of the world, in New Zealand. Recently divorced, he's ended up running the store he bought with his ex-wife. A year of separation and divorce process uh, behind me at this stage and, and much more ahead, so it was, uh, it, it was a, a tough time, yes. But in his heart, Matt is no shopkeeper. Trapped with a business he can't sell, Hiking in the wilderness is a welcome relief from the daily grind. I was stressing over the sale of the business. I had a lot on my mind, um, and, a, and a trip into the mountains was just what I needed to, to actually relax and, uh, and enjoy, uh, enjoy uh, life for a week. Matt's arranged staff cover for a few days while he heads off to his beloved mountains. A long trip like that, you can forget that the rest of the world's there for a week, it's great. As an experienced hiker, Matt is meticulous in assembling his kit. He even leaves his new manager a note, detailing his route and when to panic if he fails to return. That's enough of that, little dog. Since Matt's divorce, his constant companion has been Little Dog, or LD. Always close to Little Dog, or LD. We spend every day together. Ready for a walk? Come on. Come, Little Dog. Stay here. She was a very, very timid dog when I got her. She was scared of me, she was scared of everything. But over the years, she's, she's slowly, slowly got the confidence. All right, come on. Off we go. She is great company. Matt's expedition will take him through remote mountain passes to the high altitude ice plateaus of Mount Cook. New Zealand's highest peak. It's just sheer rock walls, glaciers and water, and that, that's all that's there. And then that country was what, what I really wanted to see. It's the kind of ambitious route that has earned Matt a reputation with the locals. Many of my friends here call me the Mad Palm. Palm is a, an Englishman who's come over to Australia or New Zealand, and uh, for my love of the mountains, I uh, put the mad bit on the beginning. On this hike, Matt will totally rely on his own resources and the supplies he can carry. Oi. I always take food for the time that I'm planning on and also throw in another kilo or so of rice, which I know will last me six days. I like to push myself and, and get into country that pushes my limits. Yep. This was going to be one of the most challenging trips that I've been on. In this pristine wilderness, there are no trails to follow, and Matt is in his element as he forges a path through the tough terrain. It's a boy. Ready? Hey, Come on. There's a lot of very thick undergrowth in there, so a couple of days of, of what we call bush bashing, just forcing your way through the undergrowth. Uh, 
and then up into some high country, um, another couple of days up on Rock and Scree. Yeah. I enjoy the solitude, I enjoy the space. I was in my element and I was loving it. It was great. But after three days of battling to get above the tree line, Matt now finds himself in even tougher and more hazardous terrain. It's a very, uh, very steep and hard to find sort of place where you are taking care with every single step you take. You do not want to put a single foot out of place. Finally, at 1,600 metres up, Matt gets his first glimpse of his goal. The distant ice plateaus of Mount Cook. Oh, I was elated, and I just got up a, a, a pass that I didn't know if it, even if it was going to be pass, uh, possible. No people, no plants, no animals. Amazing country. It was just, just amazing. It just takes your breath away to look at that sort of country. Nightfall is only a couple of hours away, and temperatures at this altitude can fall dramatically. Matt knows he must start heading for the valley below and find shelter. And past, you know, what felt like the most dangerous part of the trip. Heading downhill is a relief though not without hazards, and Matt picks his route carefully. There's a, a rocky uh, gully um, down, down below where I'm walking um, with just sheer cliff walls and solid upturned rocks uh, along its base. Flushed with success, Matt feels he deserves a treat and decides to head for a hunter's cabin nearly four kilometres away in the valley below. These simple huts are scattered across the wilderness, available for anyone to use. I'm thinking, yeah, it'd be quite nice to have a, a night in a hut uh, rather than another night under canvas. I was looking down at the valley floor um, and, uh, and really, yeah, not thinking too hard about, about where I was going. But these mountains don't forgive the careless. I found myself sliding down the hillside on, on my back, trying to dig my feet in, trying to dig my arms in, and think, yeah, well, we'll stop soon. Realisation dawns that I'm not slowing down, ah! but I'm actually picking up speed. And then I realise that there's a cliff coming up. I'm not going to stop before I go over that. With nothing to grab onto and no one to help him, Matt's momentum is about to plunge him into the void. I did not expect to be alive when I hit the bottom. As Matt plummets through the air, he's certain his life is over. It felt like a very long time in the air uh, between the top of that cliff and the bottom. In that time, an amazing amount of thoughts go through your head. It felt like an eternity. I don't remember the sensation of the impact. What I do remember most clearly is the thought, I'm still alive. It really was absolute surprise. <sighs> Nothing felt too bad. Matt experiences a wave of relief. It seems he's had a miraculous escape. Oh. 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 Ah. But his adrenaline-soaked body is deceiving him. Ah. His wrist is smashed. Where there used to be a straight wrist, there's now an inch dog's leg, and it just doesn't look good at all. 
And Matt's moment of horror doesn't end there. His ankle joint is pulverized. His tibia appears to be disconnected from his foot. I'll do. You can see the main uh, bone from my leg trying to come out through the uh, skin on the side of my ankle. Ah. Ah. It is pretty excruciating pain, the sort that gets into your, in, into your gut and you actually feel physically sick. But Matt's broken bones are suddenly the least of his worries. He realizes that he's lying in a fast-growing pool of blood. There was obviously another serious injury somewhere, and I'm losing a lot of blood. I might not have very long left here. Matt needs to find out where all the blood is coming from before he loses consciousness. I start looking around. I find a, a gash across the back of my thigh. My fingers going up to the knuckle uh, is that deep. It's gone straight through the muscle, and it, it looks like a piece of butchered meat. Matt has no medical kit capable of sealing a massive wound like this, and has to improvise using a thermal T-shirt. Grabbed a thermal and jammed it into the uh, into the, this hole I'd found in the back of my leg. It took about 10 minutes to stop the bleeding, and it was a, a terrifying 10 minutes. Matt has just averted almost certain death, but he has a smashed wrist and ankle, and is in excruciating pain. He knows he needs medical help, and fast. Oh. Then he suddenly remembers. He has a distress beacon. When activated, it uses satellites to alert rescue services and pinpoint his location. I'm thinking, well, all I've got to do here is get that beacon activated, and there'll be people here within, within a couple of hours. The weather's clear, the choppers can fly, so I, I'm gonna get out of here. But Matt's search through his rucksack yields nothing, and he can't see the beacon anywhere around him. <sighs> and it slowly begins to dawn on me that this locator beacon isn't here. I haven't got it with me. I'm in big trouble. He's left it on a shelf back at the shop. Matt's usually meticulous preparation has deserted him in his hour of need. Any hope of raising the alarm is now gone. And then an even more terrible thought hits him. No one back at his shop is due to raise the alarm for another week. He and Little Dog are on their own. It's not going to be a case of an hour and a half. I'm actually going to have to keep myself alive for, for well over a week up on this, this exposed mountainside. Matt's mountain experience tells him he has no chance without water and shelter. And he has neither. I've got to get myself some shelter where I can get at water, where I can keep myself warm, where I can keep myself dry. We could have snow, we could have any sort of weather. I've got to start looking after myself. But there's nothing in sight that could give him protection. His only option is to head downhill until he finds anywhere he can pitch his tent. As each tiny movement triggers daggers of pain, Matt faces up to the prospect of what lies ahead of him. 
It's not a case of, of gritting your teeth and overcoming it. You know it's going to hurt, you know it's going to be hard. As Matt begins to drag his open wound and smashed limbs across rock and dirt, he knows he's beginning a journey through hell. But even the slightest contact with his broken bones is agonizing. It'd be nice to scramble on my um, hands and knees, but I can't even use my hands because my, my wrist is broken. If I kept the weight off the broken bits, I was fine. But as soon as I tried to put the weight on, the, on my wrist or on my ankle, I get a wave of pain going up, up through my whole body. <laughs> Nightfall is just hours away, and temperatures are already falling. Matt knows he must find shelter for him and little dog, but when he tries to press on, the pain overwhelms him. Every time I try and put any weight um, on my left leg, I can see my uh, calf bone trying to exit through the skin on the side of my ankle. Matt's tibia is no longer supported by his ankle, so there's nothing to stop it pushing directly through his skin and out of his leg. Finally, after an agonizing crawl over razor-sharp rocks, Matt's shocked body has had enough. He knows he must try and pitch a tent as soon as he can, or risk freezing to death. He has no idea whether he can manage it. He just knows he has to try. And just the basics like getting tent pegs in, or even getting the tent flattened out onto the ground into the right shape, I hope just rendered 10, 20 fold more difficult when you've only got one hand to work with. I think the adrenaline does, this, does the hard work for you. It keeps you going. It doesn't let you stop. Matt knows if he doesn't build a tent, there's no way he'll cope with the night's freezing temperatures. Generally holding tent pegs with, with that broken right hand and then bashing them in with whatever rocks I could find using my left hand. Ah! Ah! I almost want to vomit from the, from the force of that pain. Matt's desperate and gritty determination finally results in a shelter. But the 20-metre crawl, followed by the tortuous struggle to pitch his tent, have taken their toll. I'm asleep almost instantly. I'm exhausted, absolutely exhausted. But Matt's exhausted sleep is suddenly disturbed. A familiar sound drags him back into consciousness. It was a great moment. Obviously, an aircraft means, means possible rescue. As I saw it heading up the valley, I thought, this, this, this is my chance. Over here! And I'm waving it frantically, you know, over here, over here. It was a small dot, and I would have been an even smaller dot to them. Come on!
chance of me being seen in hindsight are, are very small. But uh, at the time, it was a great belief. Are they going to see me over here? But no, no. The plane's disappearance makes Mac realize that he's just a tiny needle in a giant haystack. He can only hope that tomorrow brings better luck. In his struggle to find a spot to camp, he was forced to crawl through everything in his path, including water. Matt now discovers that his sleeping bag is totally drenched. He realizes he will have to find another way of fighting the cold. For that first night, one of my big worries was hypothermia. There had been frosts every night so far on the trip, so it was going to be a very cold night, probably three or four degrees below freezing. Wearing all his clothes is the only solution. Ah! But even just trying to get them on is a nightmare, as his bones grind against each other. As Matt prepares to face the bitter hours ahead of him, he knows just clothes won't be enough. He'll need to use anything he can to stay warm. He suddenly has an idea. Oh dear. Two years before, Matt saved Little Dog from being abandoned. And tonight, LD repays the debt with her body heat. It might make a critical difference. I got the dog curled up in the middle of the tent, and I used her as a, a canine hot water bottle, and uh, we lay there and shivered through the night. It's you and me, boy. It would have been very, very uncomfortable without the warmth of that dog there. It was cold, it was a bitter night. My body was, was doing a lot of work repairing itself anyway, um, and I, I felt I was shivering all night. I was, I was cold, I was uncomfortable. <laughs> Unable to sleep because of cold and constant pain, Matt's thoughts turn to his family and how his young daughter will cope without him. Matt knows that survival depends on staying positive. Self-pity has never been his style. I was sad that they were going to be concerned. What's everyone going to do if I don't make it out? What's going to happen? I just didn't go there. Despite a night of freezing temperatures, somehow Matt and Little Dog make it to the morning. But his relief is temporary. He quickly realizes that although he's got enough food for just over a week, it's mostly dried. And Matt has no water left to boil it in. One of the things I'd actually lost in the fall was my water bottle, so um, all I had to keep water in was my, my, my billy, my, my cooking pot. Matt's managed to pitch his tent close to water. Simple for little dog to get to, but for him, it will mean enduring unspeakable pain. It took a long time of lying there thinking about it to get myself up and to go and actually do it. No. Yeah, we need water. Let's go and do it. Come on. But it's not just water for cooking and drinking that Matt needs. Unless he cleans his deep leg wound, he risks serious infection. It was harder going down, um, a lot harder, just because very hard to slow yourself down and to control your descent with all the broken bones. <laughs> Matt's entire concentration is focused on avoiding pain and not losing his cooking pot. I can't just throw it down to the, to the bottom and then go and find it, because what, what if it rolls away? What if it gets washed away in the river? I cannot afford to lose this pan. Matt's had nothing to drink for 24 hours. 
and is seriously dehydrated. His leg dressing has prevented further blood loss, but the wound is now full of cotton fiber and grit from the fall. He must clean it out ah! or risk infection. It was a, a very real risk uh, if I didn't do everything I could to avoid it. Matt doesn't have any antiseptic available to clean his wound. But he has got table salt, which he knows has antibacterial properties. It'll be excruciating, but he has no choice. With a broken wrist and ankle, plus a real risk of gangrene, Matt must somehow endure six more days before rescue is likely, or risk dying alone on this mountain. With his wounds treated as best he can, Matt spends an agonizing hour inching back to camp trying not to spill the water he's just collected. I had to keep my broken ankle and broken wrist up in the air, because if they hit the ground, then, then there was agony as a result. The trip down to the creek is such an ordeal. Matt decides to ration water so that he can avoid the whole agonizing process as much as possible. I generally got about two thirds of a, of, a, of a pan full. I decided at that stage that no, I, I was gonna try and make water last for two days so I didn't have to go down to this river every day uh, and, and put myself through that because all this movement is, is exacerbating all the, all the injuries. By eking out his rations of dried food, and gritting his teeth through gut-wrenching pain. Astonishingly, Matt makes it through the week. And miraculously, the deadline when Matt expects the alarm to be raised has finally arrived. Cheers, Eldie. Cheers. Oh. I made it. The note he's left back at work will trigger an emergency response, and the rescue helicopter should arrive within hours. For the first time in a week, Matt's spirits soar. Absolute elation to be there. You know, I've done it. That's the hardest bit over. I really, really believed I'd, I'd done it. Matt keeps a weather eye out for choppers. He reckons they'll be in the area any time now. But as the hours pass, Matt's elation begins to dampen. After a week of good weather, conditions and visibility start to worsen. By about nine o'clock, I was, I was just in, in solid cloud. Hold on. Come on. Let's... absolutely thundering down on the tent. Matt knows that rescue helicopters will not fly in a storm. He will have to wait. But the longer he waits, the worse the storm gets. Matt's thoughts of rescue are fast giving way to a new and chilling fear. The creeks on the west coast of New Zealand can rise very, very quickly with that sort of, of, of amount of water falling out of the sky. Within the hour, Matt's worst fears are realized. His tent is pitched just feet from a growing torrent. The creek next to me had gone from a, a chuckle, a gurgle, to, uh, to an absolute roar. The river was rising so fast, it had already come up probably two or three meters in the previous hour. If it got to where I was, I, was, I would have been in trouble. The swollen creek is now threatening to engulf his tent. 
if the force of that water started hitting the tent, I was going to have to get out of there. And when a deadly rumble pierces the storm, Matt's life is in real danger. You could hear rocks being washed down this creek. The sound and feeling of the shocks as those boulders hit each other was a terrifying experience. Gotta get out of here, Arby. Matt is desperate to get to higher ground. But he knows that if he crawls outside, his crippled body won't make it. There was no way I could keep my footing with one good leg in there. It was just, no, no way. I'd have been swept away. He's trapped, and the stream that was his lifeline could now be his executioner. Knowing there was nowhere I could go was uh, frightening. All Matt and Little Dog can do is hold on and pray. The sun came out um, and the river started to drop. Matt is certain that rescue is now only hours away. I spent the evening just lying there uh, at the door of my uh, tent, uh, ready to jump out and start waving things if anything started flying up the valley. But back at his shop, Matt's note to raise the alarm has not been read by anyone. And it was beginning to dawn on me that something has gone wrong here. Um, they should have been out here by now, and they haven't come. By 6 p.m., the growing horror of his situation becomes clearer. With his provisions running low, and only a question of time before infection sets in somewhere, he knows he must move or face almost certain death. If I waited any longer, and made that decision later, the whole thing was going to be very, very difficult to do. Whereas if I did it now, I could do it. I believed I could do it. Matt calculates that his only chance is to try and reach a hunter's hut he spotted before his accident. It might have fuel, food, medical supplies, and maybe even people. But it's nearly 1,000 meters below him in the valley. For a man who can barely move, Matt faces the biggest decision of his life. I'm going to have to do this the hard way. Reaching the hunter's hut in the valley below is Matt's only chance of rescue. But to get there, he knows he cannot crawl. He must try and walk. But with a smashed wrist, deeply cut leg, and worst of all, a fractured tibia, just standing up will push him to the limits of his endurance. Ah! I right, stood there for about 10 seconds. Sort of started to come over a bit dizzy. Ah! Ah! I sort of collapsed into a heap on the floor. It's like, right. well, now, now or never. But Matt refuses to give up. Somehow he must dig deep. The dog throughout all this was running ahead and, and, and loving it. She was so keen to get out there, probably as keen as I was. Matt knows his terrible wounds will fight him all the way. The only help he's going to get is from the walking stick he's made from tent poles. And I was counting paces. I was saying every number I count is one less pace I've got to take. Another ten. Another ten. It took a lot to keep going, it really did. Each time I put the weight on the ankle, you'd feel that bone trying to come out through the skin, and it was just a, a shot of pain right through, right through my body. Every step is blinding agony, while the morning's heat saps his strength further. His only plan is to stay close to water and keep moving down. I was very cautious to stay right, right next to this creek. That was my lifeline. Matt knows he's heading in the right direction for the hut. 
but by deciding to follow the creek, he soon hits a problem. He's faced with a choice between two possible routes. LD seems to be immediately keen on going right, but that path is steep and challenging. Matt decides to follow the much gentler downward slope. The log. Oh, come on. Get in here. Trying to get me killed? But come on. Somehow, Matt keeps his body going, dragging his smashed ankle over uneven terrain for two hours. But just as he starts thinking he might get out, the mountain springs another surprise. The mountainside got steeper and steeper until I found myself standing at the top of cliffs, dropping off into, into nothing several hundred meters below. Ah. There was no way sideways, there was no way down. The only choice was back the way I'd come. And, and all the effort I'd put in to get down to where I was, it was going to be spent tenfold getting back up. By ignoring Little Dog's choice of route, Matt has wasted hours, exacted a terrible toll on his body, and seriously depleted his energy supplies. I physically could not walk with the injuries I had. So it was back onto, it was back onto elbows and knees. It was probably one of the lowest points. Just the frustration. Give me a break! Matt realizes he's past the point of no return, but his route is perilous. The deep, infected gash in his leg has taken another brutal hit. If the bleeding starts again, he may not be able to stop it. <sighs> Matt pushes himself to breaking point, but he knows he must keep going at all costs. Knowing it will take all his energy just to pitch his tent again, Matt decides to rest up for the night and regain his strength. For a ninth night, temperatures plunge below freezing. Little Dog's food ran out two days ago, and she's finding it harder to fight off the cold, yet she stays with her master. We spent the night to curled up, uh, both of us, at uh, the bottom, uh, bottom of the tent. Just knowing that there's this animal there, you know, with you, sticking with me, you know? It's a reassuring thing. Kept me going emotionally, just the company of, of, of that dog there with me. The worst thing about waking up was those few moments of feeling that actually nothing was wrong. You wake up and your body feels normal. And then finding out that it's as bad as you remember it. As another day dawns, Matt knows that he must reach the hunter's hut today. With hardly any food left and his body close to collapse, he could die on the mountain. But to reach the hut, he'll have to get through the worst terrain he could imagine, thick mountainous scrub. 
It looked like it was going to be very, very hard going. It was just a continuous process of, of forcing your way, almost swimming over the top of this, this vegetation. I was just getting tighter and tighter and tighter. After three tortuous hours of struggle, Matt's dreadful injuries are taking their toll. And he's made hardly any progress. Come on, you mad bum. <sighs> Seeing Little Dog negotiate the thick scrub so easily gives Matt an idea. It got to the stage where there was no way of, of crawling over the top anymore. I was forced to squirm away underneath. <sighs> After hours of gruesome effort and delirious with pain, Matt's made it through the worst of the brutal scrub. And that was such a relief just to, to get out of that stuff and, and into this good going. I mean, I could stand up again and, and actually walk. <laughs> the hut can't be too far ahead now. But to reach it, Matt will have to force his broken limbs down a near vertical slope. I was determined to reach the bottom of this, of, this, of this slope. Matt knows he's not going to be able to control his descent. Worse, the rocks and branches are going to punch and gouge his terrible wounds. It's a bloody gamble that could cripple him or kill him. It was getting steeper. And so I was using whatever means I could. Come on. Pushing his body to the extreme has paid off. Matt is now less than two kilometers from the hut. But getting to the valley floor has not come without tremendous cost. I've done myself a lot of damage coming down this hill. My limbs are useless. Matt can only hope the worst is behind him. The hut, and possible salvation, is tantalizingly close. But just as Matt finally allows himself to believe that he's made it, his dreams are brutally shattered. A fast, freezing river stands between him and the end of a nightmare. That was so disheartening. It was so, so close. Um, but, 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 but unreachable, just out of reach. Matt's body has already had to endure more than it can stand. And now, if he wants to live, he'll have to take his shattered bones and horrific wounds into the icy water. Whether I could swim, whether I could propel myself was my real fear. Matt makes his decision. He either dies on this bank or gambles his life in one last shot at surviving. Water was absolutely freezing. All my... Muscles started to seize up. Matt is quickly struggling. His weak, damaged body is no match for the fierce, freezing current. He has to fight the current or drown. It wasn't what I needed. <laughs> I was trying to swim a river with broken bones. Matt knows that whether he lives or dies now depends entirely on the river, not on anything he can do. I felt the main current begin to pull me and it was dragging me over towards the far bank of the river. Frozen and horribly maimed, Matt's washed up on shore barely alive. He's had a miraculous escape. Every muscle in my body had seized. Everything had just stopped working.
very, very, very hard going just even to move up the river bank and away from the, away from the river. Uh, very hard. Nine days after he was injured, Matt can see the hut. But he finally has to accept that he's probably going to die before he reaches it. Cheers, LD. I remember just thinking, I might not have very long left here. You make boy. couldn't have seen a, a more beautiful sight than, than that hunter walking out of that hut. I got you, mate. I got you. Oh, lie down there. Eh? And that's the moment I know I'm getting out of here. And I can't, I can't describe as, a, a, as good a, a good a moment as that. I'm safe. It was, it was relief, it was joy. After patching him up as best they can, Matt's rescuers head off on a 13-hour trek to raise the alarm. 12 days after he started his journey, Matt is airlifted to the hospital where doctors save his leg and rebuild his shattered ankle and wrist with metal pins. Six months after his horrific experience, Matt is back in the mountains with little dog. The experience has made me realise what I, what I value in life and what I don't. Having got out, you appreciate those companions that you have through life so much more. 